in chapter 49. Chapter 49 starts the second section of the second part of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, as we said, uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is broken up much like the Bible is. In the Old Testament, there's 39 books. Well, uh, and then you have 27 in the New Testament. Well, in the book of Deuteronomy, you have the judgment of God explained and how that God was coming judgment on Israel in the first 39 chapters. And then you have the comfort of Judah, of, of um, Israel, and God's coming again uh, in the last 27 chapters. It's interesting, those last uh, 27 chapters are divided up into three different uh, groupings. And we saw chapters 40 through 40, 48 deals with the, uh, of course, the whole chapter, the whole group, chapter for the 27 verses, or 27 chapters from 40 to 66, deal with the comfort of God. It begins with comfort, my, comfort ye my people. Tell them what's going to come. Christ is coming. And he's the hope of the world. And that's the comfort that we have today. That's the hope of the believer, isn't it? And so we see that he says, uh, and then, but then we have it divided up into four different or three different sections here. Chapters 40 through 48 deal with, uh, with God's comfort for his people. But it also, it, he intersperses, and that's the reason I didn't put the, each, each one of them didn't, each one of them are, he, he, what I mean by this, he'll, he'll go from one to another. It's kind of hard to outline. But, uh, but he talks of three basic themes. And that is, first of all, the comfort of his people, those who are looking forward to the Messiah coming. And then also his great, his utter contempt. And we saw the sarcasm that was even used about idolatry and how, and how that uh, they worship the very things that they made. And they would uh, use wood and they'd use part of it to make an idol and another part they'd burn to, uh, burn to uh, warm themselves. And he said, how can that be? And so he was very sarcastic and hating idolatry. And then we see that he had control over the nations and control over history. And how that uh, he, would, he would talk about nations that, and empires that weren't even in existence yet. And about people that weren't even born, especially a man named Cyrus. 150 years before he was even born, let alone before he would conquer the very, the very um, Babylon, which wasn't even an empire yet. And yet, uh, so we see that all these things were ahead that, God, that he was saying. But ultimately, of course, the, it was going to be about the Messiah coming, who was going to come about 725 years later than even what uh, Isaiah is speaking. And that's the second part he's talking about. Now, in the, it's, uh, the first part was about comforting people. Now, the next nine chapters, he's going to deal, deal with the servant Messiah. The, the Lord Jesus came as a servant. He took upon himself the form of a servant. So Paul tells us in uh, Philippians chapter 2. And so he's the, servant, su the suffering servant Messiah. Now, what makes this so difficult for the Jews uh, and the rabbis all the way up until the time of Christ, we know more about what the Lord was doing and the plan of salvation than John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist said, you're just not acting like the Messiah we thought about. Are you he or are you the Messiah or do we look for another? And the Lord said, there's not a greater man born among women than John the Baptist. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In other words, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, that he died for your sins, that he rose again for your sins, and that he's coming again, you know more, you know more about salvation and the plan of salvation for the ages than John the Baptist. It doesn't mean that you know that you're saved any different. No, he was saved because he was looking for the Messiah coming the first time. We look back at the Messiah coming, but we're looking forward to him coming again, are we not? And so many of the Old Testament uh, or the people between the, um, the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, which is about 400 years, there are rabbis saying there must be two different messiahs. And yet we'll see that uh, he talks about the Messiah as both the conquering, machine, uh, the conquering Messiah, as well as the conquering king, as well as the suffering servant. And that's a very difficult thing. Of course, there's so many things about the things we don't understand about the tribulation. But one day I'll tell you about them. How about you? 
because God doesn't have to tell us everything, but he gives, tells us just enough to keep us on our toes. And so they were looking forward. Even back before Isaiah, before even Abraham, there was a guy named Job who said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know he's out there. I know he's coming. I don't know when, but I know he's coming. Well, I know my Lord came, and I know he's coming again. Amen? And so we see that uh, he's the, it's the coming, his coming is prophesied, which we're going to look at this morning in the first three chapters of 49, 50, and 51. We're going to see also that great passage of Isaiah 53, which is uh, the section 52 through 54, where we see his salvation is provided. And we'll see that great passage that is used more than any other passage, Isaiah 53, in winning Jews to the Lord today. And so we'll see Isaiah 53, uh, the salvation that is provided as a lamb before the slaughter was dumb, so he opened out his mouth. But then in chapters 55 through 57, we see that message is proclaimed. And we'll see that uh, great, and this is the reason we call it the gospel of Isaiah, because some of the great, great preaching on salvation by the prophets was, in, was Isaiah. And some of the great, the noteworthy passages that many of us say, such as his word will not return void. That's in Isaiah, that's the, 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 that passage there. And all these other, and about, let a man uh, forsake his thoughts and his ways. Repent. That's all part of Isaiah 50, 55. And so we see that uh, the gospel that Isaiah is preaching 725 years before the Lord Jesus ever came. And so salvation is provided. And then we're going to see his message proclaimed. But then uh, in the last section, we'll see his sovereignty, where now he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And now he's going to set up that millennial kingdom for a thousand years. And so that's the last section. And we will try to get into that with, and to try to skim over the surfaces like we've been doing without getting very, uh, or going and spending several years in the book of Isaiah. But uh, one of the difficult things is on a Sunday morning, preaching to people, many that don't have a Bible background, and giving you a taste of it without getting into the, into, into the woods so deep that you can't see your way out. So that's what we're trying to do, is give you a, a synopsis of what Isaiah is saying without trying to get too deep and getting you so that uh, you can't see the wood, what, the trees because of the forest. And so we begin now in chapter 49, and we see, even as Paul says, back in Romans uh, chapter 1, Paul says, a, a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So here Paul is saying that I'm just preaching to you what Isaiah is preaching. And I'm going to preach to you, and I'm going to write to you concerning the son, his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So obviously Paul is interpreting the, the writings of Isaiah as the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we see this, uh, chapters four, uh, 49 through 51 now, give us some of the most the greatest pictures in all the Old Testament of that suffering Messiah, that anguish that he went through in his ministry, the sacrifice that he took upon himself when he made himself in the form of a servant. And so in chapter 49 now, we look at it, he says, listen, O coastlands. And when you see that word coastlands or isles or coast, he's talking about continents there. And he's talking about the different, uh, when you come to a shore, we left, you know, you left the English shores and you came over to the shores of America. Well, that, that's a whole new continent, isn't it? Well, that's what he's talking about. You coastlands to me. So he's talking to the whole world. And take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name and he has made my mouth to, like a sharp sword. And the shadow of his hand, in the shadow of his hands, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. Now, first of all, then, we see that he sets forth the fact that Jesus Christ was born an ex from an exceptional birth. 
from a miraculous birth. Because he says, notice, take heed you people, because God has called me from the womb. We don't have problems with that. But the next word, which is translated in the King James as the bowels, but uh, in the, of course in the, the New King James in the matrix. Matrix and is the idea, uh, it's, it's the system that people can't all put together. It's the things in between. Listen, we know that the cause and effect that when a child is born because there's been a seed and an egg and so forth. But whenever God came into Mary, it was a total, it was just like when he created the world. He created it out of nothing. He changed her entire body in order for her to, her to have that child. And of course, it was not the, what we would think of of conception. It was, uh, it was a totally different experience. God used the the areas between things we don't understand the, uh, to, to bring forth a child. We know, you know, with us, we know exactly where the birds and the bees, we know exactly how it happens. We don't understand it all, but with the Lord, we can't understand exactly what God did with Mary because he created a child out of nothing. And how can the God man come? How can God come in the flesh and dwell among us? I mean, Mary had to be a very special person. And so he's even using terminology. He says, this is going to be a different thing than you've ever, than the world has ever known. This baby, and of course, the Lord is talking here, out of the matrix of my mother, out of, uh, and notice, uh, she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus. He has made me uh, and mentioned, uh, and uh, he made mention of my name. Now, the angel came and told Joseph and Mary, his name shall be called what? Jesus. So he was named. He says, and he has made my mouth like a sharp iron. Oh boy, could he preach. The greatest preacher in all the world was the Lord Jesus. Sermon on the Mount is the greatest message ever written. I mean, he was a sharp preacher. When he preached, people said, this man has authority. Yes, because he was the word. And so he had a mouth like a sharp iron. And in the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. That is one of the phrases that caught my mind because he says the same thing over in chapter 51 where he says that we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter 51, verse 16, where he talks about us or talks about those who know him. He says, uh, and I have put uh, my words in your mouth. And I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. He's talking about Paul. Paul uses that uh, even in his own message. How that God, the idea of shadow of the hand is the idea that God created the world, the, the world with his hands, did he not? But he just put his hand over so that, that he's controlling everything with us. The world can't see it. The Lord Jesus was raised in Nazareth. Nazareth, and he increased in wisdom and knowledge and in favor with God and men, but people didn't see it. Remember when he came into his own, whenever he was born, he was born out in a stable. And even those people who knew the scripture and they could quote it and they could tell you exactly where he was going to be born and, and, and the circumstances which he was going to be born and they missed him. It was under the shadow. They missed him because they did not know him. But folks, God always cuts through the shadows with those who believe him. And Simeon and Anna, and there's a lot of other people that knew the Lord Jesus. And whoever sought the Lord in the Gospels always found him. But for the world, it was a shadow that was mysterious. They didn't see it. And yet the very hand that created the world had his hand over the Lord Jesus. Folks, God has his hand over you. And the world may think we're insignificant. The world may think that uh, you and I don't mu mean much. But we are, uh, not only are we in the shadow of his hand, we'll see in this passage we're even written in the palm of his hand. God knows you. And the greatest thing about it, your name is written in the book of all books, the one that you want it written in. And that is what? The Lamb's Book of Life. God keeps a record. God knows those are his, and God protects those who are his, no matter what age, no matter what generation. God has a very special place 
for those who serve him. The world might not see it, and other people may, and, uh, and your, the closest relatives may not know it, but God has a plan and a protection and a care for you in each one of us. And so we see that now the Lord Jesus, as he grew up under the shadow of the hand of the Father, so you and I are under the shadow of the hand of the Lord today. And so we see, first of all, then, his virgin birth. But then notice also, he says that uh, his anguish. Notice that now he didn't grow up uh, and it was just so peaceful and he just had a halo over his head. No, he had problems. Can you imagine growing up, uh, you mothers, how would you like to have a perfect child? Now, I remember when I grew up, uh, I got up at 6 o'clock every morning. I had my devotions. I uh, went in and I helped my mom wash dishes and I, I, I cleaned up after myself and I kissed her and thanked her before I went to school. And uh, they just don't make kids like that anymore, right? No, I didn't do any of that. You know, no, and, no, and most of us didn't. We all, my mom had to teach me what not to do. She never washed my mouth out with soap, but she threatened it a couple of times. But you know, uh, and so we see that we, my mom had to teach me what not to do. Can you imagine having a child that, he's perfect. How would you like to be his younger brother? Uh, be like Jesus. Oh man, I would, I would have a hard time with that, wouldn't it? No wonder, no wonder his brothers had a problem with him until they got saved. And so we see that he says, and he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, uh, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've done all this work. Now this, these thoughts went through the Lord Jesus' mind. He says, I've labored in vain. I have, uh, I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely your just reward is with the Lord and my, and my work was with my God. He became obedient unto death. We, so we know that he preached and he wearied himself. And he would even talk with his disciples. Oh, you have little faith. How many times do I have to show you? He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knew about all our problems. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us there's no trial, no temptation taking you, but just such as common to man. Or, or he says, we have not a great high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. For he was in all points tempted like, or tried like we were, we are, yet without sin. So he's had all the problems. He knew what it was like to, uh, to suffer rejection. He knew what it was to grow up, uh, be, to be misunderstood. So again, Jesus knows all about our sorrows. Because, and he can guide till the day is done. So he's, he identifies with us. But notice he says, now the Lord in verse 5, and now the Lord says, who has formed me from the womb to be a servant. He came to earth to be a servant, to be his obedient servant. And he became obedient even to death, even to the death of the cross, to bring Jacob back to himself, uh, that Israel would gather. So ultimately, that is the reason that God came. He redeemed to redeem Israel. He says, now, so, and he says, uh, for uh, I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Next, speaking as a man here. Indeed, he says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob? Can God do that? One day he will. And we see that he says, now notice he says, and I have also give them in verse 6, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. We see that in, in uh, John chapter 10, where he's speaking to the Jews, but he's saying that God has made me a light, not only to you, but to all nations, to the Gentiles. Now to the Jew, wait a minute. You know, heaven is a wonderful place just for the Jewish race. You know, some of those Pharisees would sing songs like that. And no, the Lord said, no, I came to save the world. He told Nicodemus, that Pharisee or that, uh, that uh, high government official in the Sanhedrin. He says, for God so loved the Jew that he gave his only begotten son. Is that what he says? No, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So notice, yes, I'm coming as the Messiah, but not only the Jews, but of the entire world. And I'm going to be a light to the Gentiles. Later on, whenever Paul is commissioned, and when God calls him to preach in Acts chapter 13, he says, you will be a light to the Gentiles. Not you, but the message, 
Jesus Christ. You're carrying the light to the Gentiles. And so again, we see this prophecy that is coming out and even the gospel that echoes through our gospels in the New Testament are, are here in the book of Isaiah. He says, you shall comfort my people. Now, he, goes on, he deals with that uh, in verses uh, 13 through 18. And again, uh, he says, sing, O heavens, be joyful, and uh, bring out uh, the Lord. Oh, excuse me. Let me just go back. There are certain things that I just can't. Um, he talks about what God's going to do, and there's going to come a time when all the nations of the world are going to come and worship him in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And we know that's Zion. But there's a place here. Notice he says in verse 12, Surely these things shall come from afar. So people from all over the world are going to come. Look, those from the north and the west, and those from the land of Sinem. And uh, that word, what was Sinem? And I did a little word study, and then I heard a fellow who gave a word study on it. It's marvelous, marvelous what you can do with the internet today. But... Uh, uh, he shows the word that that is China. China one day is going to come and worship the Lord. Now we know uh, that China is going to uh, figure very prominently as uh, in the book of Revelation in the Battle of Armageddon. But even after that, people, you, folks, we don't realize some of the healthiest churches and the growing churches in the world today are in China. They're suffering great persecution. But uh, I think when we get to heaven, we'll be surprised at how many people from that 1040 window, China, India, right across there, Muslim. I understand from what missionaries are telling me that, uh, that there's a great movement for the Lord in some of those Muslim countries. Now, once you get saved, you can imagine what it would be like to, to be a woman who got saved in a place, well, a man or a woman, child. Uh, who would be saved in a country like that. And yet they are willing to give their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so even in China, there's coming a day when the people from China are going to come worship him. It's not there yet. And like we said, if it hasn't happened, well, it will happen. And so, but then again, he goes back in verse 18, or verse 13. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and bring out, sing. Uh, oh, mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people. Wait a minute. You're just talking about all this turmoil. Yes, but that's the hope of the believer, is there's a better day coming. Uh, so we see that uh, he says, uh, and then, well, let's go on to verse 15. Uh, because there are people who are saying, you know, um, well, let's go back to verse 14. He says, but Zion, the Lord, uh, uh, Zion said, in other words, there's a lot of people in Israel that had given up. They've given up on the Messiah. He says, the Lord, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. And there's many Jews that feel that way today. And what the, notice the question the Lord asked though. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Shall they for, uh, that they may forget? Yet I will not forget you. How many of you ladies forgot your child? No, it was a mother's instinct, right? Now, unfortunately, there are those out there that will stash them in a uh, garbage can. I we did something, uh, some, some lady made news the other day about leaving her child in the bathroom after born. You know, all of these crazy things that happen. But naturally, or a, a woman's instinct na of nature, unless it's been perverted, once they know they have a child, it's something very dear to them. And he says, can a woman, how can I forget you? See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. There's that the phrase. So one of those great phrases that we like to think of. The world, the God who made the world has your name in his hands. The very hand that made the world has your name. And he thought about you when he made the world. Can you believe that? It's a hard one, isn't it? But that's my God. He says, and your walls continue. The idea of walls is the idea that of your protection. I mean, you've been the Sid talking about Zion here. Um, your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and all the laid waste. Uh, listen, I'm going to, Israel one day is going to be 
the, the capital of the world. Jerusalem's going to be the capital. And so this is the hope. This is what, Paul, what uh, the Lord told Abraham way back when. And this is still the hope of the Jew, is that the Messiah is coming, and we're going to be, we're going to be ruling the world with him. And it hasn't happened yet, folks. And by the way, the river to the sea, when God talks about the river to the sea, he's not talking about the, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean. And that's what people are trying to wipe out today and all that. He's talking about from the Euphrates to the Mediterranean. He's going to take the whole area whenever Israel gets into its own or comes into his own during the millennium. So he talks about this. So very quickly, he says... Uh, and I'd love to go through the rest of this chapter, but we won't. But, um, it knows, but, but then again, he just makes a statement over in verse 25 where he says, uh, uh, what, did he tell the, what did he tell Abraham? I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And notice what he says here in the last part of the verse. He says, for I will contend with them who contends with you, and I will save your children. I would hate to be folks that would be fighting the Lord today. Uh, God is going to bless those who bless the Jew, and God's going to curse those who curse the Jew. And yes, uh, it looks like many times the Jew is losing, but the Jew is the apple of God's eye, and we're not going to do with, away with them, folks. We got people in our in our government right now, I heard of some government bureaucrat who says, yo, we need to dismantle Israel and get rid of them. Uh, we're not going to get rid of them. Because God, they're, God has, they're the center of God's prophecy. They're not the church. Although a saved Jew today can be a member of the church. You understand what I'm saying? But there's a whole different way of, but the, we are, uh, like that's the reason I like uh, Jew Christian Jews. They're double blessed. They're God's children, and they're God's children. Are they not? I'm just God's children. I'm not. One, I'm not a. I'm not the apple of His eye as far as uh, His uh, by blood, but I am by grace. Amen. And so we see that uh, He says. Uh, now, the chapter four, fifty, we see that He goes on from this. Now he, he says again. He warns these people, and what is happening here is that uh, he's ex exhorting the unbeliever. And uh, he says, uh, Thus saith the Lord, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce? There are many people that believe that Israel now has been disqualified and that the church now is God's bright and that Israel is just no more and they call it replacement theology and that we are the Jew or we are God's chosen people. No. God will still deal with his people. And there's even a, uh, one thing that uh, this passage brings out is that God hasn't divorced Israel. Israel's left God. But God hasn't divorced and broken his covenant with him. God cannot break it. God cannot, is not a God who can lie. And so, yes, Israel's away from God, but notice how that uh, he explains it. He says, uh, where's the certificate of your mother's divorce? And whom have I put away? Or which of my creditors is, and to whom have I sold you? For your iniquities, you have sold yourselves. You are the ones who have gone out. And your transgressions, your mother has, put, uh, has been put away. I mean, you are the one who did it. It wasn't me. I didn't let, it's, you know, who left who? <laughs> and so it's uh, that, Still reminds me of that. I think I told some of, some of you that uh, story I read in, uh, the, uh, in something about uh, a 70-year-old man bought a car in uh, Chicago, and it was, a, it was a Corvette Stingray. He's 70 years old, and he said, well, he took it out on 294, and he was going to run it down the road at uh, 2 o'clock or, or whatever when there was, wasn't a lot of traffic. And he got up to 70 miles an hour. He said, I wonder what this thing could do. And he hit 100 miles an hour. He said, I'm not even down to the floor yet. And he gunned it. And he was going, and he was getting up to 120, and all of a sudden he saw a blue light. And he said, I think I can outrace that guy. He said, no, wait a minute. I'm a 70-year-old guy. What am I trying to outrace a cop for? And so he went in and pulled off to the side. And the policeman came up to him. He said, sir, 
I've been just, I mean, I've had a rough day. And I'm going to be getting off my shift in 15 minutes. If you can tell me why a 70-year-old man is out in a Corvette Stingray trying to, uh, over 100 miles an hour at this time of day, I'll let you go free if you've got a good excuse. And the fellow said, son, back a few years ago, my wife ran off with a, with a state trooper, and I thought you were bringing her back. And the state trooper said, have a nice day, sir. <laughs> you know, here, who ran off from who? Israel has joined himself to idols. Ephraim has joined himself to idols. Let him alone. Who left who? And so God said, you want to go? You can go. And so they've gone, but God hasn't divorced them. They're still his covenant. And one day he's going to bring them back. But they were the ones who said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Were they not? And so they've suffered greatly for their rejection. And so God will bring them back. And so we see that he says, uh, well, verse 2, Why then, uh, when I come, was there no man? Uh, when I called, was there none to answer? You didn't answer me. I, I, Isaiah's preaching to him, and they tried to kill him. He says, In my, is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? Are you telling me that I can't save Israel, that I can't save you? And so I haven't written you off. You're the ones who've left me. He says, or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, uh, with my rebuke, I drive, I drive this. I can do all these different things. He goes through about, uh, I clothe heaven with blackness. I can do all these different things. Can I not? Is my hand so short that I can't save you? And yet you have turned away from me. And so we see that he preaches this. Now, he goes through this, and just let me give you another couple of great verses. He talks about how that God has given him a tongue of the learned in verse 4, and he would be a preacher. And again, he goes through being that he would be a tremendous speaker. But in verse 6, notice, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard, and I did, and I did not hide my face from the shame and spitting. Did that happen? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, there's something that brought up that I hadn't thought of. But why didn't the people, on, the two men on the road to Emmaus, know who Jesus was when they first saw him? Why didn't Mary, who was at the tomb, and she didn't know him until he spoke? Why did, why did, was it because his face was still so marred from the pulling out of the beard and, the, and, the, and not only the, the scars on his hands, but also the scars on his very head? Was it that he was so mangled that he was totally altered because of our sin and the plucking out the beard and so forth? That would be a good conjecture. In other words, but I, whatever it is, I... You know, we, when we look on his face in heaven, it's going to be tremendous. But uh, I, that's, one of those, that's one of those things I'll let you know when I get there. How about you? But uh, they didn't even recognize him even after he was resurrected from the dead. And so, yes, he put up with a lot. But then notice in verse 7, he says, For the Lord will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Notice he became obedient to death, but he and the Father stayed close together. Remember, they, he prayed to him all the time. In his flesh, he was as weak as you and I. But in his spirit, of course, he was strong because he was God. But he says, therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And that I will know and not be ashamed. Now, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 9 that he set his, feet like a, uh, his face like a flint. He, was go he knew what he was doing. He was not... A man who was born in an un, uh, unplanned birth and grew up not knowing what he was doing and was mistakenly murdered. No, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was going to the cross and he set his face like a flint. How many of us would want to do that? How many of us want to be crucified next week? But he said, I will do it because this is the only way of salvation for those who believe. 
So he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face to go to the cross. And so he died for you and me. And so he set his face like a flint. But then he warns those in verse the, in the rest of the chapter, verse 50, or chapter 50. He says, among whom fears the Lord in verse uh, 10. But then let's go on down to verse 11. Look all of you who kindle fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks, uh, walk in the light of the fire. In other words, you, a bunch of you are worshiping a lot of false gods, fire gods, and everything else. He says, um, this you shall have from my hand. You shall, not, you shall lie down in torment. So there's the gospel. The gospel is a two-edged sword, isn't it? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All one of the syllable words that a first grader could understand. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're on your way to heaven. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have the Son, you're on your way to hell. That's a harsh one, isn't it? But that's exactly what God says. And he says, even those who are without him, lie down in, in torment. There, and two times the Lord says, in this, uh, the first nine chapters in verse uh, 40, the last verse of 40, in chapter 48, he says, there's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And then in this section, which is Jesus Christ being proclaimed, in chapter 57, he says, there's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So yes, it's the gospel of Isaiah, but it's the, the gospel that heaven and hell, which one do you want? And so we see now in chapter 51, and we must hasten on. I hope I'm giving you enough to whet your appetite to go back and look at more. But in chapter 51, we see him again. Listen to me now. He says it three different times. Listen to me. And then he says, awake, awake, twice. So that's five times the number of grace here that he said, listen to me, wake up. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. So, hey, you people who are seeking righteousness, you people who are saved, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn. In other words, you were saved and look back at what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. Is the Lord Jesus Christ your rock? The Lord's my rock in whom I stand. Do you, can we sing that? Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And so we see, look to the rock. Look back at what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. And he says, look to Abraham, your father. Of course, talking to the Jews here, but we can talk about the cross. He said, look to you. And what did Abraham do? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And he's the father of our faith. That's the one thing we see in Scripture. We are sons of Abraham in spirit, as, as, as Paul tells us. We're not Jews, but we've been engrafted in because God says to him, he came into his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the authority to be called children of God. And so we have been engrafted. Israel hasn't been done away with. God's just broadened the, the scope. And he's allowed whosoever will. Now, of course, the, anybody who was saved, and we know many, and we see several people in the Old Testament that were saved that weren't Jews. So it's always been salvation is, is to the Jew or Gentile by grace. 6,000 people in, the, book, in the, the city of Nineveh were not Jews that got saved. And so we see that God knows what he's doing and he calls whosoever will be, may be saved. But he says, for the Lord will comfort Zion. Notice there's that again. Verse, two, verse three. And he will comfort all her waste places. He will make her, uh, her wilderness like Eden. Notice it's going to be, the, the millennium is going to be like the Garden of Eden worldwide. And her desert uh, shall rise and gather, uh, uh, gather uh, the Lord Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. There's going to be singing. The hills are going to be alive with God's word. So we see, first of all, listen, look back. Look at what God says and look, look what he's promised. And look what he's promised from the very beginning. But then notice in verse 6, listen to me, my people, and give ear, 
Oh, my nation. We see that he was doing that back in the last section of uh, for, for chapter 48. But he says, uh, uh, listen, and give ear, uh, a nation for the law will proceed from me and I will make my justice rest. And so he says, uh, God has promised and says, look ahead. God has promised that he's going to give you rest. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And what will I do? I will give you rest. And this whole section deals with that. And then again, he's talking about everybody. He talks about the coastlines again, or coastlands again in verse uh, 5. Whatever continent you're in, God will save. Whosoever will may come. And he says, in my arm they shall trust. And he talks about that arm in his hand and how strong and what he can do. He says, he says uh, in verse 6, the last part, he says, the world will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. This whole world's not my home, folks. It's going to die. But my salvation is forever. Is yours? Do you know the Lord Jesus? So we see, he says, look ahead. The Lord is going to change things, but you are going to live forever. But then in verse 7, again, we see, listen to me, because God will take care of the wicked. Oh, I look around today. He says, my, he talks about, um, he says, they do, he says, do not re, uh, to fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. In verse 8, for the moth will eat them uh, like a garment. He goes on, he says, um, and my, but my salvation is from generation to generation, the last part of verse 8 there. But he was saying that, you know, evil men are going to, they're going to be around. But uh, guess what? You're on the winning side. So look, uh, can you trust on God? Can you wait on him? Listen to me. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Again, I think of that Psalm 119 where the writer for 176 verses is very concerned about somebody who's trying to destroy him. And yet he would keep his mind on God and on his word. And that's the battle. That's the one thing that we want to do as Christians. And so listen to me. Look around. Can you trust me that God can take care of your enemies? Can we? That's a very difficult one, isn't it? And so we see that God will take care. And will God take care of Hamas? Is God going to take care of the liberals in Washington who are trying to destroy Israel? Will God take care, will God take care of all that corruption that's going on that they're trying to destroy the churches in America and in Canada today? Is God going to take care of those people? I, my prayer is that God will save some of them. Amen? And so that's, well, God's not willing that any should perish. But God's going to take care of all that. Can we wait on him? There again, they that wait on the Lord, back all the way back to chapter 4, that shall renew their strength. They're going to see what God can do. So wait on him. Look to see. And then we see, wake up. Awake. So listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Now get your mind. Wake up. Hey, fellas, quick, don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep on me. Listen to me. Wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't mean to, that to you there in pew number 3, whatever. But again, he's just saying, awake. He says, Put on strength uh, of my arm. Awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are you not, uh, are you not the arm of Rahab? Uh, 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 that cut Rahab apart. Rahab is interesting because many times that term is not about talking about the woman. It's talking about Egypt being Rahab. He says... Uh, no, so you, you wounded the serpent, of course, that's Satan. You dried up the sea, and of course, that's the Red Sea crossing, but in chapters 10, verses 10 and 11, for, uh, for redeemed, the redeemed crossed over. So he's talking about, notice how many times in the Old Testament that, that whenever God is preaching to his people through his prophets, he goes all the way back to that redemptive time when they passed from slavery and they were delivered from evil through the Red Sea. It's a picture of redemption. We don't have time to, to picture it all today, right now, but the Red Sea crossing is mentioned more than any other miracle in the Bible. It was a picture of salvation. And so he says, I can do it. 
and uh, I've ransomed you. I've freed you. Notice uh, in verse 12, I, even I, am, uh, am he who comforts you. Comforts you, my people. And so I'm the one. In verse 19, and, and you forget the Lord your maker. Don't forget him. Awake. Don't go to sleep. Keep it alive in your mind. And then in that verse 16, he says, yes, you've got all kinds of problems. But he says, I have put my words in your mouth and I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. There again, those who love God, those who will preach his word, God, you have guaranteed protection of God. And as someone has said, you are well nigh, um, you are well indestructible until God's through with you. And when he's through, what's the worst thing the world can do to you? Kill you. What's the best thing the world can do for you? Kill you. Because absent from the body, what? Present with the Lord. And so, you know, they can't do anything to you that I don't allow. And I like what Paul, he, Paul got to the point, he said, man, I'm ready to go. Absent from the body. I mean, I had to stay around for you turkeys because he wants me around, but I'm wanting to go. So, you know, there again, what can they do to us? Can we really trust God that much? But then in verse 17, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, because I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to, you know, Zion is my home. It's going to be my city. And Zion is where I'm going to, and that's, folks, they, the Jew is still looking forward to that. They're wondering how it's going to happen. And so you and I, because there's all kinds of bloodshed and all kinds of evil going on in that city. Three different religions claim it and all that. But God knows exactly what he's doing, does he not? And guess what? Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the world one day. And you and I are going to, are going to be ruling with the Lord. And people from China to the uttermost parts of the earth are going to come and worship the Lord there. Can we trust him for that? Can, do we know? And so we see he covers us. God has covered you. And whatever God has in your life, it's for, by his divine appointment. God has a plan for your life. The world might not see it. The, even your own family might not see it. But underneath all the things that are going on in the world today, like, like Jesus growing up in Nazareth, they had no idea what was going to happen next. I have not seen nor ear heard what the Lord has for those who store, who love him. Can you trust God with your life? Oh, the world, you may not ever become famous. You may not know exactly the end from the beginning, but God does because he knows the end from the beginning. And he has a purpose for your life. And he has a comfort that for those who will come and trust him. Do you know him? That's the gospel in a nutshell. What have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? Look back at the cross, but look forward to his deliverance Look forward to him coming again. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the fact that we can come to you and that we could hide our souls in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. We thank you that we can hide our lives in the depths of your love because you cover us there with your hand. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you will never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, we pray that as we look forward to you and for your coming, Lord, that you would allow us to have the great privilege of seeing that light of the world spring forth in other people's lives and save them. Lord, that you would turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto yourself. Oh, Lord, the blessing, the great miracle 
of salvation that you've so freely given to those who believe, to us, how we pray that you would allow us to see that new birth, that light shine in others. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.